morning, guys. Good morning. Let's, let's, hey, let's give those guys a hand, man. Man, that praise and worship ushers in the presence of God in a huge way. It's good to be with you this morning, man, and I leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. It's so important. Um, it's kind of like, you know, like I said last night, legend, legend's what you do. It's like you accumulate uh, trophies if you're an athlete. But you think about that. You can give me a lot, a lot of trophies, you know, but a year after you had that trophy, that trophy just sits on a wall somewhere. And what's it do? It collects dust. What did Jesus say? He said, store for yourself treasure in heaven. Amen. Where neither rust nor moth break in the seal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that's a question we got to answer, guys. Where's our treasure? Well, I had, a, I had a pastor say it this way. So you want to know where your treasure is? Look at your checkbook. Whew. Wow. It got quiet in church that day. Where, look at your checkbook. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Man, legacy. You know, uh, people have called me living legacy. You know, one of the, I don't know, top five or ten wrestlers ever and all that stuff. You know what? That doesn't mean anything to me anymore. All, all that the, the fame means to me today is that it is the avenue by which God has given me a platform. Well, I was running hard and fast away from God. He was building the platform I stand on now. Because he knew one day he'd get a hold of me. One day that I would surrender. Like I said last night, guys, before we commit, we have to surrender. And we're all in and we're not in. Legacy. One day my children will stand over my grave. What are they going to say about their dad? What, what it's, you know, legacies, legacies, what you leave that lives on. What are we going to, what are we going to leave guys? That's going to live on Psalms 90, 12 says, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, on a number of our days, it's not about a date, but it's about doing something with purpose and being intentional. You know, I always pray, Lord, open my spiritual eyes that I might see the path you've set before me. I pray it every day, guys. Lord, let me see. Let me see with spiritual eyes today. Where can I go? What can I do? Who? It's kind of like we're all called. We're all called to make a difference. And when necessary, use words. Let your light shine before men. When people look at you guys, when they look at you long enough, they ought to be able to see a difference in your life. There's something different about that guy. What is it? And eventually, they're going to ask you. And eventually, God will open the, open the door so you can, you can tell them. Those are God-ordained moments. And God's timing is always perfect. <clears throat> knowledge is I know what to do. Wisdom is the value of knowledge applied. Wisdom is taking the knowledge and all that stuff you know and applying it in a way that's going to make a difference in somebody's life. That's the difference, you know. And the Bible also tells us that if we seek, if we ask for wisdom, God will give it to us. He'll give it to us and give it to us and give it to us, but it's up to us to do something with it. <clears throat> you know, I'm 66 years old now. And of course, you know, as you live your life, you, uh, and you contemplate death, you know, we always, always want to think, well, death's a long way away. <laughs> you know, you know, well, it's a lot, it's a lot closer now than it was. It's a long way away. It might be today. You know, uh, <clears throat> after lunch today, I would go back to, 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 to my room and take a little nap. You know, I might not wake up. <clears throat> One of my friends, a wrestler named Roddy Piper, died in a hotel room in Los Angeles. 
He went to sleep that night and never woke up. And I kept trying to find out what had happened. Apparently he had a blood clot. And I have had a partial blood clot in my left calf at one time. And I asked the doctor, how do you know it's partial? He said, because if, well, if it was a full blood clot, and he said, your, your leg would be so, rolling, so swollen, so red, and you wouldn't be able to touch it. But I had to get on blood thinners. But that's what happened to Roddy. He had a blood clot, and it dislodged, went to his heart, and killed him in his sleep. Guys, we don't ever know. We don't ever know. So we have to take advantage of every day. Make the most of every day. <clears throat> so what, what, are we, what are we building? Are, 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 you, are you looking for the life list or the bucket list? You know, we always talk about it. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with us. You know, it's like there's a lot of things, you know, that I would like to do, that I would like to see. Now, I, I, I've probably traveled more of the world than most of you. But I saw it as I was... You know, I didn't really see it. It was like I just went by it. You know, this town, the next town, the next town. But I have been on three, three trips to Israel. And every time I go back, I learn something new. And I go there for the express purpose of drawing close to God. So I go with purpose. There's nothing wrong with, you know, there's places I want to see. You know, I, I, uh, you know, I'm, I was always uh, enamored by, you know, Rome, the Roman people, the first great democracy. I've always wanted to go to Italy, see the Colosseum ruins and all of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But reality is, you don't want to build that bucket list. You want to build the life list. Store up those treasures in heaven. Because that's the reward. That's the true reward. Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17 says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Can't be any plater to that. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. God has a purpose and a plan for every man, woman, and child. Do you know your plan? Do you know your purpose? And if you've discovered your purpose, then what are you doing about it? And every day is a new day, guys. Every day is a day. You know what? And here's the thing. You know, I, times like this and meetings like this bless me. Because this is a weekend. You guys all have jobs. You all have families. And you could be somewhere else doing something else. But you're here. You're here this weekend because you came here, I hope, and I think, and in my heart, realize that you're here because you want to draw closer to God. You want to come in fellowship with other like-minded people who believe as you do, as we do, and we are here to worship God. But everything we do, everything we do can be an act of worship. I mean, when we talk about praise and worship, when we sing, when we sing to God, and that's awesome. I mean, it's like I, I go to some churches and as a speaker, and, and they'll say, well, Ted, when do you want to come out on the platform? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, you know, some people like to wait until it's time for them to speak, you know. And, and uh, I said, no, I want to I I I be there during the praise and worship. Because if I'm part of that praise and worship, that's getting me right where I need to be for whatever God has to say. Now, there's no, I have nothing, I mean, there's other, other guys that I, I get it. I mean, there's some guys who don't want to go out there right away because they want to have that private time with God in prayer, and that's just the way they are. So I'm not knocking anybody for not wanting to be out on the platform. That's just me. I want to be there. I want to be, I want to be there for all of it. That's my, uh, that's my way. Opportunities, man, a short amount of time. Think about that. Uh, have you guys ever heard that song, Live Like You Were Dying? Who sings that? Yeah, Tim McGraw. You know, Tim McGraw married a girl from a, a little place there outside of Jackson, Mississippi. This place is so small, and I can't remember. Who did he, he marry? Faith Hill. Yeah, she's from, she's from Mississippi, Mississippi girl. But live Like You Were Dying. 
Live like today was the last day of your life. Think about that. Man, I got one day. How am I going to make a difference? Because, guys, that's why we're here. That's what we're all called to do. Make a difference in somebody's life. We all are equally loved, but we all have different skills. We all have different gifts. Apply those gifts as we can. And weekends like this or for that, they are for coming together, for worshiping God, and to encourage each other, to build each other up. I have no doubt that, you know, a lot of you guys, you know, that you've been coming here for years, you have you know, a lot of friends here. And there's times like this when you come together and you need some help and you need, you need somebody to, to just hear what's on your heart, share. We are called to carry each other's burdens. That is our Galatians verse. When we carry each other's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. We got to make a difference, guys. That's what, that's the legacy. Now, I, my hope and my prayer is that when I die, that my sons will carry on what I started. That I won't be remembered so much as a legendary professional wrestler. Who cares? but I will be remembered as somebody that did my best to make a difference. And that's what I'm trying to do in the state I've lived in for 35 years. And right, 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 right now, people are attacking me. You know what? That's the devil. That's the devil trying to, to destroy it. But God fights my battles. And my faith is in him. You know what? So I ain't going to worry about it. He's going to take care of it. And where I battle for it is on my knees. And that's where we all battle for it. Opportunities in a short amount of time. Think about that, guys. Think about this this weekend. You know, I mean, we're all... <clears throat> you know, I named, I named my ministry Heart of David. Why? I studied David's life. Here was a young man who, as a young man, had this zeal for God and this faith in God. I mean, David, who wrote so many of the Psalms, and we read those Psalms and go, oh, my gosh. This young man who had so much faith in God that he was willing to, when nobody else would, go out and face a giant. But when, when David went to face Goliath, as he went to face Goliath, he knew he wasn't going in his own strength. He knew that his God would not be mocked, so his faith was not in himself, but in God. And he knew that it wasn't he who was going to about to kill Goliath, but that God was going to take him out. But that same David, the David who slew, you know, slew the, the giant, went on to be an adulterer. Not only did he commit adultery, but he tried to lie to cover it up. He brought Bathsheba's husband in from battle, got him drunk, sent him, sent him home in hopes that he would lay with his wife and they could say that was their child. But Bathsheba's husband said, I will not go to bed with my wife while my brothers are out in battle. He shamed David. So David sends a message with him, a sealed message takes it to the commander of, of the troops, and he, he reads the message, put him in the front where he'll be sure to be killed. So David is, David's guilty of murder. So how could God say, David is a man after my own heart? Guys, here's why. Because God knew that at David's core, in spite of his flesh, in spite of his, his, uh, his weaknesses, that David would never stop getting up. David always took full responsibility. You know, when he was called out, David didn't try to make excuses for it. He said, my God, my God, against you and you alone have I sinned. David always took full responsibility for, for the choices he made. But David kept getting up. And our Savior, <laughs> what family lineage did Jesus come from? David's. 
got to keep getting up, guys. Because as long as we live in this flesh, this flesh is weak and it stinks to high heaven. We have to live in it and we have to try to control it every day. And there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. There's going to be days when we, uh, when we stumble and maybe we just, uh, we just skin our knees. Man, there's going to be days when we fall hard. Get up. Get up. Ask God for forgiveness and carry on. The thing about David was God knew his heart. God knew his heart. And God knows your heart. You know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of great preachers. I have a friend who was a, it's a pastor friend of mine. He was my pastor for a while. He left Mississippi and he went down and he pastored a a church in in, uh, Florida. And this church was really growing. And he was, I mean, he was actually at the time being touted as possibly being the next, uh, head of what the Southern Baptist Convention. And he fell. He had a moral failure. He, you know, one time thing. He handled it better than anybody ever. He, he, did, he didn't even hesitate. He immediately confessed to his wife, stood up and confessed to his church, and he said, and they wanted, they wanted him to stay. He says, no, he said, that'll never work. And he stepped down. But God restored him. But I remember him telling me this. He said, Ted, he said, you know what? Here's what happened to me. He said, I have this zeal for God, and and my church begins to grow. And he said, and I forgot. It's not my church. It's his church. I'm just a steward of what God has placed in in my care. He He said, I forgot. It ain't about me. It's all about him. And that was the lesson that he had to go through. Now, he's at another church, Valdosta, Georgia, and his church is thriving. Guys, we all blow it at some point in time. Get back up. Get back up and carry on. Because God knows your heart. At the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you don't want to be a Pharisee. There's a lot of religious people in the world. There's a lot of religious people who go to church every week, punch the clock. But do they come to events like this? Are they engaged in the ministry of their church? Are they feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, taking care of the widows and the orphans, visiting the prisoner in prison? Are they doing those things? And... I will go so far to say, even if they're doing those things, even if they're doing all of that, are they doing it so people will look at them and say, oh, you're great? Because here's what God judges, our our motive. Why? 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 Why am I doing what I do now? And I'm doing what I do now because I came to a point in my life where I recognized that an unbelievable, massive God who could, I, I could never even comprehend his size loved me in spite of all my failures, in spite of the countless times that he had blessed me and I blew it, he still loved me. And when I finally said, here's my life, Lord, you take the helm of the ship, everything changed. Because then it became all about what it is today. It's all about him. Lord, you send me. I remember one time uh, I uh, was still in the wrestling business. I wasn't wrestling anymore, but I, was, I had gone from the, what was then the WWF to WCW, the other, the competing entity. And uh, we had an event in Detroit and, you know, Detroit's near the Canadian border and about like a like a hundred miles from a place called London, Ontario, and and it was a church that contacted me there, and they said, Ted, if you come in a day early for your event, we can pick you up, bring you up here, we can, we'll do an event with you, and and take you back to Detroit. And I said, okay, that'd be great, you know. And so, and I'd wrestled in London, Ontario before. I mean, and this is, you know, I I was still on television regularly, and so, man, there's only like twenty people in this 
Covenant Church. And I was just kind of like, wow. I was deflated like I was expecting a lot more. But I did what I'm supposed to do. And one, one kid got saved. One, one kid, one teenager came forward. And I prayed for him. And then I greeted the other 19 people. Said hello, shook hands, what have you. And he waited. He waited till everybody left. And he said, Ted, he said, I wanted you to, I wanted you to know this. He says, you saved my life today. I said, I said, what? He said, you know, when I left home today, he said, I was looking for a place to commit suicide. And I, I went by this church and I saw your name. I'm always a wrestling fan, so I was curious. And I came in and he says, congratulations, when you started preaching, I started to get up and leave. He said, but for some reason, I couldn't get out of my seat. <coughs> Go figure, right? And I said, well, son, I said, I didn't save your life. God saved your life, and more, more importantly, your eternally mortal soul. But here's what God spoke to me. Don't worry about who's there. Don't worry about how many are there. It ain't about you. It's about me. He says, you're like the Pony Express. The press. Carry the mail, deliver the message, and let me do what I can do. Because you can't do that. Yes, Lord, lesson learned. So I carry on. And that's what we all should do. We're not God. But we are to be, to the best of our ability, whatever our, whatever our gifting is, be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus to a lost, dying world as much as we possibly can, show compassion. I can't remember, this was not very long ago, but I remember a, uh, it was on the news that uh, there was a guy who was convicted, uh, found guilty of murder, and in the courtroom, I don't know who the lady was, but it was a relative of the person who was killed. I don't, know, I don't know if it was a mother, a sister. I can't remember any of that. What I remember is this. They showed this woman run up to this guy, throw her arms around his neck, and they said, she forgave him. Right there in the courtroom, I forgive you. I wish I, wish I could get the other rest of that story because I guarantee you that changed that guy's life fact that somebody that you know like I killed your son or I killed your husband she forgave him wow could we do that just like uh, I shared the story with you last night about about the, the young man who was in the church and he was from Rwanda and was there doing all that ethnic cleansing and his wife was he repeatedly raped and, and killed in front of his own eyes and he finally found a moment where he said, I've let it go. And I marveled at God. Could we do that? Because that's what we're called to do. But more than anything, we're called to make a difference. You can't make the next step of life if the wrong things matter. So the question th this morning is, what really matters? What really matters? Legacy is, what re legacy is what really matters. These three things matter. First, God. God matters. First thing that God will ask, and when we die, Scripture says, absence from the body and the presence of the Lord. You take your last breath and close your eyes. When you open your eyes, you're going to be before God. And the first question he is going to ask is, what did you do with my son? And I ponder that. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's hard for us to understand that, but we, we get it. But the Son, the Son of God, the Son who is both fully God and fully man, the Prince of the universe. Imagine, and I know how much I love my sons, and I, I can't, I, there's no way that I could comprehend because nobody can comprehend the love of God. 
But as much as I love my sons, would I be willing to send my son, number one, to come into the world and become a man? That's really taking a step down. And then to live a peasant's life, born in a stable, Jesus' own words, I came to serve, not to be served. And I give my life as a ransom for many. And allow your son to, to die the most horrible death imaginable. If you've ever seen, and I've seen, I've seen them talk about it, and, I, and they explain what crucifixion is, and how, and, and the Romans were perfect at doing it. It's a horrible, excruciating, slow death. You think about that. That God would send his son to die for us. That we might have life. And you stand before him and he's going to say, what did you do with my son? I gave you life. I sent the prized possession of, uh, that I have on your behalf. All you had to do was follow him. What did you do with my son? How are we going to answer that, guys? We need to, you know, I... I I challenge myself with that question too. What am I doing with Jesus? And to the best of our ability, in spite of our flesh, which is, is wretched and stinks, to the best of our ability, we're to make a difference. Make a difference, make a difference. Relationship, relationship, relationship. I'm going to say it over and over and over. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's a relationship with God, and it's, a, it's an inner relationship. It's all based on relationship. Think about the closest relationships in your life. Think about the sphere of influence that you have in your workplace. So you call yourself a Christian, maybe like me, you wear a cross around your neck, and do you hang out at the cooler and tell dirty jokes? What are you doing to make a difference? How, how are you letting your light shine? Put all your passion towards a relationship with God. First and foremost, put all of your passion towards that. Because as we do that, if that becomes the number one, and it has to be the number one thing in our life, everything else is going to fall into place. Like I told the guys that came forward last night, you're, you came forward because God spoke to your heart. God is dealing with you about whatever it is, and in obedience you came forward. God honors obedience. Always. Christianity must be the highlight of life. Your faith. You know, and we live in a culture now where, you know, a lot of people... They're finding out, you know, all you have to do is turn on the news. You, I mean, guys, we're considered radical. We're radical because we believe in life, because we believe that, uh, you know what, God gives life and God get, it takes it away, yet we've, we've, we've abor we've, there are more abortions in the United States than anywhere else in the world, anywhere else, every, anywhere else in the world. But we're radical because we believe that. You know, I said this a long time ago. I said, the day's, the day's going to come, and I don't know, it may not be too, too far in the future, where well, they're going to start rounding us up. And they're going to put us in camps because we're radical. And when that day comes, are you going to care whether the guy standing next to you is a Baptist, a Methodist, or a Presbyterian? Heck no. All you're going to care about is that he believes in the same Jesus you do. So if that's what it's going to be then, why is it that way now? I don't care where you hang your hat. Because all the things that separate the church denominationally don't have a single thing to do with salvation. So what, what if a threefold cord is uneasily broken? We are stronger united than we are divided. But the devil's done a real good job of dividing us on all these doctrinal issues. All those
those doctrinal issues, you know what? We ain't going to know the truth until we get there. And apparently, they're not that important to God. What's important is this. There's a story like a missionary. A missionary, he goes to a third world country and uh, he gets he gets his leg caught in a trap and this native comes along releases him from the trap nurses, nurses his wound and they're going back to the village and he says you know when we get he, when he, he was planning when I get back to the village with the guy he says I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share I'm going to share Jesus with everybody I'm going to convert him and they're crossing this bridge and the bridge collapses and they both they both die didn't have a chance to share it. They both go to heaven. And the pastor, the minister who knows scripture, knows what he's looking at, sees all the things that had been described that heaven would be, finally lays his eyes on Jesus and he goes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the native, the chief, said, so that's his name. Get it, guys? Just because missionaries haven't been to a third world country, there's a lot of people that have ever knew, really knew, know, but they know. We don't know how God does that, but we know he does. What really matters? Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But whatever, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. Paul is saying, everything. Everything I had, forget it's worth losing all of it for the sake of Christ. And basically, guys, I told you about that story. You know, I was on the bus on the way to Chicago after I had confessed to my wife, and I'm reading that book, Maximize Manhood, about character and, and integrity and being the spiritual leader of my home and all those things. When God whispered to me, Ted, you've got everything you thought you ever wanted. What do you have that matters? Nothing. In that moment, I realized that all of that meant nothing. That was the beginning of the change in my life. And, that's, and when I answered that question, I was basically saying the same thing Paul said. It's, it's empty. It's worthless. Forget about legend. Build a legacy. Guys, we worship things that don't matter. You know, as we were watching that video this morning, you know, God bless you guys for giving and helping that lady. You know, I've been on three mission trips to India, and I've seen some unbelievable poverty. You know, and I, uh, the, the things, the commercials that come on TV, feed the children, uh, you know, you see these little kids with bloated bellies and tears and what have you, and you know, I, I've given. I picked up the phone and got my credit card out. And, yeah, I, you know, James Robinson, I support different ministries like that. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that you're touched and that you do something. But then, you know what, you're, you're at home and you're, you're in your recliner and change the channel and forget about it. But when you're standing on the street in India and that little boy's got his hand out and he's looking you eye to eye, Everything changes. We are so blessed in this country, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it was like, I think you guys heard me say this last night, you know. I forgot there weren't TVs in the rooms here. <laughs> That's one of those things with me. I just would, TV, I turn a TV on just to have noise sometimes. But there's no TV. You know, and God kind of whispered in my ear, gotcha. 
I got you all to myself, which is exactly what I should be doing here. And that's what I've spent my time doing. But guys, that's the thing, is, is we have so much here. There's so much that we have that three quarters of the world doesn't have. It's, it's, it's unbelievable how blessed we are. Quite frankly, and it's unbelievable how ungrateful we are in, in some ways. You know, and the older I get, it's like, you know, we, uh, when my wife and I, you know, we had three kids, and so I, I built a big house and uh, had a pool in the backyard and all that stuff. And my kids grew up and they moved away. And one day I looked at my wife and I said, what are we doing? I said, we're spending all this money to heat and cool this monster. I said, we live in three rooms. Sell it. So we sold the big house and we rented for a little while because we we're waiting for something. So we got another house. I think it's like half the size, like 2,300 square feet, whatever. But in reality, I tell you right now, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I could live in a condo. You know, because so, I still got a garage and I got a bunch of junk in that garage. It's amazing how much junk you move. I'm going to ask you a question. You ever seen a hearse pull on a U-Haul trailer? <laughs> Guys, when we die, we ain't taking any of it with us. So what's it really worth? We have to be intentional. We have to be intentional because we don't know. We don't know when we're going to take our last breath. Live like you were dying. Live like you were dying. What what changes would you make in your life if you know that today, today was your last day? Yeah, and, and, and for people who find that out, people who, you know, go to the doctor and, and, and out of nowhere, I've got cancer. Bang. Wow. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this guy. His name was Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd was a professional wrestler, but he's also, he was a professional football player. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs, and then I think he played for the Chargers. And... Uh, uh, but then he became a wrestler and uh, became a good friend of mine, became a strong Christian. He got diagnosed with stomach cancer, and the doctor said, Ernie, you need to go home and get your things in order. You've just got a, you've just got a few months left. And Ernie looked at the doctor, and he said, doctor, he says, well, I'll do respect. He says, I hear what you say. He said, but you know what? My physician's got a lot more authority than you, and I think I'm going to be around a while. He lived another six years because of his faith in God. Where do we put our faith? Where do we put our hope? My pastor buddy, Hal, who I talk about all the time, his wife's name is Pam. He told me this story. They, uh, they met this girl at a funeral, and uh, she was a senior in high school. She was a softball player, select team softball she was a pitcher, had a great pitching arm. And she, she told him, she said, they played me too much. Winning the game was more important than my arm, shoulder, and health. And now softball is over forever. You know, what's really important? I'm going to tell you what, I would say the same is true in the NFL. I think this thing, they're changing things, all the stuff about concussions and stuff like that. But I know stories about guys who, you know, you know, they get hurt, you know, and they give them a shot so they don't feel the pain. They put them back in the game. It's just meat on the hoof. So what is most important to all those people? Winning and money. Attorneys. I hope there are, I don't know if there's any attorneys in the room. But by and large, an attorney's going to represent you. They want to win. It's about winning and the money. You ever have to pay an attorney? Hmm. Well, my youngest son, who's in hot water, he has to pay an attorney, and he doesn't have the money. So guess who's going to pay it? The million-dollar man, who's not a million-dollar man. <laughs> God, please help me. And that's what's sad. 
So it's not about justice anymore. It's about winning and money. It's a sad scenario, but it's true. The media, I mean, I'm, de I'm dealing with that. Just so they can tell a story, they, they will tell a half-truth. And in the Bible, a half-truth is a lie, period. Just to sell papers. They don't care what it does to you, how it affects you or your life. They don't care. Men, we got to make a difference. There's an anemic need for godly men in our country. Anemic need for godly men in our country. And if you pay attention, churches aren't growing. Are we in the end times? I think we are. I mean, I'm not a, I ain't going to predict anything. But I know that what God said would happen in the world is happening. That the world would, would, would go back to the same depravity it was in when he destroyed it the first time. He said, but I'll never, not, next time it'll be by fire. And I hope none of us are here. I don't think we will be. People matter, number two. People matter. You matter. I matter. But we as people, we're human. We get our feelings hurt. We get mad. We get angry. It's like a guy said, every day I forgive people because I hate people. <laughs> wow, what a Christian, right? Every day I forgive people because I hate people. <laughs> wow. Man. Unforgiveness. I said this last night. Unforgiveness and holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. The only one suffering from it is you. <laughs> uh, here I, I, should, I said it this way. It's like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies from the smoke. The only one suffering from it is you. And God said, forgive as you've been forgiven. That's it. Bingo. And there were a lot of hands that went up last night. And, and because of what my wife and I went through, and as my wife joined me, as she has, and, and we, have, we do some marriage ministry together, and she talks about unforgiveness. And I remember her telling me in, in, in the midst of our conflict that she said, she goes, the thing that I'm mad at you the most about, he says, you, you have interrupted my relationship with God because I know what he wants me to do and I don't want to do it. But I had already made a decision I would, before I ever opened my mouth and confessed, I had said to God, come on board the ship and take the helm. Take me wherever you will. I had already, I had already made that commitment. But my wife's forgiveness, guys, the confession I made was brutal. Most women would have run but the fact that my wife was willing to stay and give me another chance was the catalyst for who I am today. Was this happen overnight? No. No, no, no. No pain, no gain. It's that way in everything, fellas. You guys know that. Uh, whatever, whatever you do, you know, athlete, doctor, whatever. You got to go through the pain to get the gain. Galatians 5, verses 13 through 15. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. 
Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. Are we doing that? Man. <laughs> you know, we all have our moments. I have a lot of those moments when I'm driving. You know, and I remember this one day I, I, I got behind this car. Now, I'm on a, I'm on a four-lane highway. Not, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, an interstate, but it's a four-lane road. And the speed limit is 35. Easily could have been 50 in my book. <laughs> and so I get behind this car, and there's cars in the other lane. And uh, it's like they're going 20. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, what are you doing? You know, I'm beside myself. And then I finally get the opportunity to get up and, and pass them, you know, and I'm about to tell them, you know, speed up or get off the road. I look over, and it's this elderly old lady. And God whispered in my ear, he says, one day that's going to be you. <laughs> oh, God. Grace, 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 please forgive me. We all have those moments. Live, live each day like it's there, your last, guys. Be intentional. Be intentional. You know, my, my, my pastor buddy, Hal, he's so good, I mean, like, we try to, actually, we were going to go on a cruise this month with he and his wife. Uh, God bless him. I know one of his things is conquering fears. <laughs> and I don't think he really wants to go, but he's going. Um, but they, uh, gosh, what was I going to say? I lost my thought there. Live like you were dying. Uh, Hal is very intentional. When I go on these cruises with him, I mean, he's just one of those people. We'll, 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 go, we'll, go, we'll go sit in the hot tub, and, man, he will strike up a conversation. We, no matter where we go, we, he strikes up a conversation. I have met four people. He's met. I have watched him. And then, and then, and then you know, time will go by, and he'll, we'll be on a conversation. He says, hey, Ted, you remember that guy we met on the cruise and da-da-da-da-da? Yeah, yeah. I said, well, I've stayed in touch with him, and now he's going to church got saved. Wow. I need to be more like my buddy Hal. The thing that I deal with, I'm just confession here, because of the fame, because of the, the notoriety I've had, you know, and because sometimes, even now, I can't believe, I'm 66 years old, I haven't had, I haven't had wrestling tights on in 30 years, and you'll never see me in them again. Uh, I, I'm recognized. I feel like I'm recognized more now than I was when I was in my prime. You know, I've even changed the hairdo, <laughs> wearing glasses. Anyway, but it's like, uh, well, it's like this. I remember I, I was I was uh, crossing. I was coming out of Canada in Toronto, and I just cleared the customs, and I was in the, the little newsstand, and I saw this. It, at first, it looked like a girl from behind long hair, but it kind of had the hair up and, and like a, a, it's like a, I don't know, it looked like a knitting pin through it or something. I don't know. It was kind of weird. And I'm wearing a shawl. But this girl turned around, and it wasn't a girl. It was Steven Tyler, <laughs> the lead singer of Aerosmith. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's Steven Tyler. So I went out, and I called my wife. I said, Melanie, I just saw Steven Tyler. Well, go up and introduce yourself. I said, no. Nope. I said, he's doing what I do when I don't want to be bothered. He's not making eye contact with anybody, so I'm going to leave the guy alone. See, but that's not the way I need to be. And I'm getting a lot better about it. A lot better. You know, and I don't know why, but God seems to do this to me on airplanes. He'll always sit me down next to somebody. And I, I, was, I was going to Japan one time. Now, Japan's 14-hour flight. 
and I sat down next to this guy, and, and you know, on an international flight like that, you know, you got a TV, you got, you know, obviously you got a reading light, and my, my reading light's not working. My TV's not really working. It's a 14-hour flight, and this is not good. Uh, and so the guy sitting next to me, he says, do I know you? You look kind of familiar. I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I know you. And uh, he says, uh, I said, are you a wrestling fan? You're Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man. And I'm thinking, oh, please, God, 14 hours sitting next to a rabid wrestling fan. Why? Why? Because I want you to talk to him. Guys, by the time we got to Tokyo, I had led him to the Lord. So. But what I'm saying to you is I need to be more intentional. I need, to, I need that, that shouldn't be a one-off that happens every now and then. I should be intentional every day. We all should be intentional every day. Now, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're running around looking for somebody to, you know, stand on the corner and, hey, you know, let me, or, you know, like, uh, you know, like no, go door to door, uh, you know, like, uh, can I come in and share with you the four spiritual laws and tell you why you're going to go to hell if you don't receive Jesus Christ? No, that, that's not what you want to do. Let God set it up because he will. But be mindful and be intentional and be looking with spiritual eyes and listening with spiritual ears. And he'll set it up for you. The difference, though, is a legacy. The first question Jesus, God would ask, is, what did you do with, my, with, with Jesus? Second question will be, what did you do to impact others? There it is. What did you do to impact others? You know, not only, you know, it's like when I, when I first... Uh, now, because of, of my professional reputation in wrestling and, and, and the, uh, I guess, the respect for my wrestling ability, a lot of the guys, you know, when I went through this ordeal, and now they see me start showing up. I'm not going to the bars with them anymore. I'm not doing any of that stuff. And I'm wearing Christian T-shirts with a Christian message, and they, they said, ah, you know, Ted almost got, he lost his marriage and, you know, don't worry about it. He'll be back. I'm glad those guys didn't hold their breath waiting for me to come back. And I actually remember, I remember one time I was sitting in the, in the, the restaurant at the Marriott Hotel. I can't remember what city we were in, but I could look across the lobby from where I was sitting and see the bar. So all the other guys were over there in the bar where I used to be, hanging out with them and, Chasing the women. And I remember sitting there thinking, what was I thinking? I mean, I was looking across there, and it was just like, I was out of my mind to think that that had any value. Because my mind had totally changed by then. But then, you know, the other thing I found out was, you know, Jesus said, you are what you behold. So I'm back in wrestling. My heart has changed. My life has changed. All the priorities in my life have changed. But I'm still on the road with a bunch of guys that are hell-bent. You are what you behold. If you're going to stop drinking, get out of the bar. If you sit there long enough, you're going to drink again. So it came to, what happened to me is it finally came to a place where I was like a year later, I went to Vince and said, Vince, I said, uh, this, this summer, summer slam event will be my last. So I, I, I got to go. And he really didn't want me to go. I said, I, but I, I, and I didn't really go into any detail because, you know, here's a guy running a business, you know, and it's, you know, whatever my reasons were, I didn't think he would understand. We had a conversation about that later. And he said, you should have shared it with me. But anyway, uh, I I left. I left the WWF. I went to work. 
I went back to work for a company in Japan. And what was the difference? Well, number one, Japan's a foreign country, foreign language, and you know, it's like you don't know your way around. And so it was almost like going on retreat. Even when I wasn't living for God, all I ever did in Japan was go wrestle, go back to my room and read. <laughs> I said, wow, that'd be great. You know, that way I can go back to and read my Bible and, and do devotionals and, you know. Well, and that's the step I took to make a difference because I still had to make a living. And I had not gotten to that place of surrendering to evangelism yet. But it was like two tours in, I herniated, or these discs in my neck manifested themselves, and, and my wrestling career was over. And I was about to turn 40. That's when I went back to the WWF, but I went back as a manager and a commentator, which only required me to be on the road. Uh, back then, they used to tape their shows once every three weeks, and it was two days. They would do three shows one night, three shows the next night, and then, then, then I would have to go to Stanford, Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut one day a week to do uh, voiceovers for the shows because I, I was a commentator. So God had taken care of me. But I had to take the initial step. I had to, number one, to separate myself. I still had to make a living. So I go to Japan. I'm doing okay. And then, boom, my neck goes. And Vince calls me. He says, I want you to come do this commentary for me on a pay-per-view. So I was like the color commentary guy with him. He said, you did well. He said, would you like to do it some more? And that's when he gave me the opportunity to come back in a managing role, managing a wrestler, which basically means I was his mouthpiece and doing this color commentary. God provided a way. But I had to be intentional about separating myself from the environment. And God, you know, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And so, bang, I'm right back there. I'm working for the company. I'm making a living. But am I on the road all the time? No, I'm only on the road uh, two, two days, uh, once every two weeks, and then one day a week. In the, in the studio. So God made a way. But guys, we have to be intentional. Uh, the second question, what did you do to impact others? We discussed that. That's the place of reward, you know. Again, store for yourself treasure in heaven. You know, some of, us, uh, some of us are going to have mansions in heaven. Some of us are going to have huts. <laughs> what will you have? That's a question we need to ask ourselves, you know. That's, how are we going to deal with how Let's deal with that, you know. Uh, Matthew 25, 35. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. Guys, are we being the hands, the feet, the heart, and the voice of Christ on earth as we should be? And even if we are, don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied with, 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 with where you are. It's like in, in, in sports, or anything really, you're only as good as your last game. Now you got to go out and do it again. And keep going. Keep going. Keep pressing forward. From the moment of our salvation, then the, then the sanctification starts. The sanctification part lasts your lifetime. Because as we go forward, God starts chipping away at the things in our life that don't need to be there. And when we get over one hurdle, he says, okay, take a deep breath. Let's get on to the next issue because we all have issues. We all have sin in our life. And as long as we breathe, we're going to have sin in our life. Let's take care of the issues. Last, what matters? Eternity. Eternity matters. Oftentimes, you know, we don't think about eternity until somebody dies. You go to a funeral, especially 
if somebody dies unexpectedly or young. Wow. My, my oldest son, Ted Jr., had a friend who, uh, just like him, married his high school sweetheart. They had a little girl, and his wife was diagnosed with cancer. Her name was Megan. And Megan fought it for, I mean, several years and was outstanding in terms of her growth as a Christian and the impact she had on other people's lives. But now, you know, she is, you know, she finally succumbed to cancer. She died this last year. You know, and there's my buddy's son with a little girl to raise by himself. Of course, you know, it takes a family to raise a kid anyway. There's a lot of friends and everything. But, you know, that's when you start thinking about it. Live like you were dying, guys. Eternity. Because um, we're going to meet him face to face. We're guaranteed to meet him face to face. Guard against greed. Greed of any kind. Luke 12, 15 says this. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in, a, in, a, in an abundance of possessions. It's not about the stuff, guys. You never see a hearse pull in a U-Haul trailer. You can't take it with you. So these are the questions that we must ask ourselves, and I have to ask myself. Am I doing all I can do? Am I being passionate? Am I being intentional? I have good days and I have bad days like everybody else. We've gathered here as a group of men to praise God, come close to God, ask God for help, ask God for forgiveness, and ask God to help help us carry on. So I would pray today, Lord, show me the way. Eternity matters. So how do you know what's next in life if you don't know what matters? You don't. But what matters? God matters. People matters. And eternity matters. Let's be intentional, guys. Let's, let's commit, you know. There are times I say that when I give an invitation. You know, maybe... You know, um, maybe you're at a place where you've been doing really good. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. But because of the culture we live in, and we're being bombarded by things from the outside all the time, all the time, constantly. Plus, we, we live in a country that has been so blessed that we, you know, we take so many, so many of the, our conveniences for granted. And then, and then we watch a video like this about a woman who's all of her all of her possessions are sitting in a corner, and we go, "Wow, I am so blessed." Sometimes we forget. It's time to remember and thank our God, you know, for where we are, what we do have, not what we could have. Eternity matters. Next session, we're going to talk about purpose. But right now, if you guys would close your eyes, bow your heads, and we're just going to pray. We're going to close. Father God, we, we a bunch of men, we come together, Lord, right now. And we've gathered here today. And we've gathered here this weekend, Lord, because we love you. Because we're here to seek your face. Lord, and I, I pray for, for all the men, including myself. Lord, that you would, reveal, you would reveal to each of us that chink in our armor. That issue in our life that most needs to be dealt with. Whatever it is, Lord, that we, we might deal with it here this weekend. Lord, that you would forgive us of any unconfessed sin 
And again, Lord, that you would give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. Not knowledge, Lord, but give us the ability to know what to do with the knowledge and how we would apply it in our lives so that we can be the best that we were meant to be, that we might take your gifts and your talents, those that you have given each of us, and apply them in such a way that we make a difference in the world. Lord, that we would truly be your heart, your hands, your feet, and your compassion. Help us to be compassionate. Lord, help us. Help us to even love those who don't love us. Lord, that we might truly be the salt and light you called us each to be. That we could be that shining light on a hill for somebody today. And then again tomorrow. Again, Lord, open our spiritual eyes to see that path. And give us the courage, Lord, at times to do what's right, even when it's difficult. And once again, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to be here as a group of men. Lord, we thank you for your blessing, for your forgiveness. But again, Lord, most of all, we thank you for loving us all enough to take our place on the cross. And we pray this prayer in your name, the name of all, all names, the name of Jesus. And all God's men said, amen. 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 All right, gentlemen, thank you very much, and I will see you again at lunch, I think, or just after. Thank you.